Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining in. Uh, we're going to be starting our webinar. Uh, my name is Doug Weinstein. I'm Senior Vice President of Operations with ACAM, one of South Florida's leading property management firms for both HOA and condominium associations. Joining me today during our webinar will be attorneys John Stevens and Ronya Wiggins from the law firm of Stevens and Goldwyn, leading condominium and HOA law firm here in South Florida. As you are aware, the Florida legislature just concluded their 2024 session, and it was a very busy one as respects condominiums and HOAs. There's gonna be a lot of information given during today's webinar, and I wanted to do a few housekeeping points one being, should you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A, and then we will try and get to as many as we can at the end of the uh, webinar. The information today that you will be getting will be general information concerning the legislative bills that were passed. And they will not be specific to your association or your condominium. And as always, we suggest that you consult with your own council and accounting firms, if should you have any questions with the legislation as it pertains to your particular association. There were three main bills that were passed and enrolled from the last legislative session. They are HB 1203, which dealt primarily with homeowners associations, 12, uh, HB 1029, which dealt with condominiums and hurricane protection, and then HB 1021, which is being called Condo 3.0. So we're gonna be starting with 1203. And at this point, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Ms. Wiggins, who will take us through the HOA portion of the bill. Okay. So as was was mentioned, we went through that, okay, the three bills. So I believe we are on slide four is fine. Thank you very much. Okay, so for HB 1203, as was mentioned, um, this particularly concerns homeowners associations. So anything that I reference in terms of an association for this particular bill, it is only pertinent to HOAs at this time. Okay, so basically, some of these amendments will seem familiar and they may seem kind of minor. For example, the credit card, um, you'll see that under certain circumstances, a credit card cannot be used. And there were amendments uh, made in order to specify certain penalties if a credit card is used under particular circumstances. But then there are also major amendments that were made, specifically the last four, for example, um, greatly limiting or changing vehicle prohibitions, finding procedures and architectural modification approval authority. And of course for HOAs, those are very important items. Um, just to let you know the extent of this bill, it was 44 pages long. Um, so it definitely covered a lot of, of area for HOAs. And the effective date will be July 1st of this year, 2024. Okay, so getting started on slide five, we will go ahead and move into the actual amendments. So first, as we know, a lot of associations, if they're large enough or if the board so chooses, they contract with a management company in order to handle their day-to-day -day operations. Um, one of the important um, changes that was made in HB 1203 is the information that managers must provide to HOAs and their board, specifically the name and contact information of all the managers on the property, the hours of availability of all such managers, a summary of the duties of those managers, and a copy of the management contract upon request. So this equally applies to the board and to all of the members, okay? All of this information must be actually posted on the association's website if they're required to have a website. And any change that actually occurs to this information must be updated and given to the HOA board and all of the members within 14 business days of that change, okay? So just to make sure that property managers are up to date with changes like those that we're discussing today, there are additional continuing education requirements that were added specific to uh, homeowners associations. 
uh, specifically that every two years, a manager must complete at least five hours of continuing education that is specifically related to homeowners associations. And three out of those five hours must relate to record keeping. Now, if there have any managers who are in the audience, you know record keeping is a constant topic. It always comes up. So, of course, the legislation also made amendments concerning official records, official records requests, the procedures for responding to official records requests. And unfortunately, depending on what side of the, the coin you're on, they added some uh, criminal penalties as well if there is noncompliance with the official records requirements. So just moving into that quickly. As we know, official records typically have to be maintained for seven years. However, it is now required for an HOA to establish a policy for maintaining their official records. And if this policy says that those records must be maintained for more than seven years, the property manager must maintain those records for seven years. So the seven years is now a minimum and the board can specify a maximum. By January 1st of 2025, any HOA that has 100 or more homes must post um, all of the official records that are listed within the particularly amended statute on the Homeowners Association's website or make those official records available through a cell phone application. So for example, this includes any documents that may be voted on at a particular members meeting. That type of document would have to be posted on the website at least seven days prior to that meeting. Okay, so specific to that website access, it must be password protected and any owner who would like access to that particular website must be given the credentials in order to log in. So I mentioned that policy that must be put in place by the HOA board establishing how the, the official record should be maintained and for how long. That policy itself also must be posted on the website if the association is required to have a website. Okay. As far as the criminal, criminal penalties that were unfortunately imposed, we have three different categories. The first being one, now a second degree misdemeanor. It's for anyone who knowingly, willfully, and repeatedly violates official records request requirements, and it must be with the intent of causing harm to either the association or any association member. Now, under this situation, repeatedly means you have to have violated the official records requirements at least two times within a 12-month period. It's a first degree misdemeanor for any person to knowingly and intentionally deface or destroy any specifically accounting records during the period for in which those accounting records must actually be maintained or to knowingly or intentionally fail to create such um, accounting records if they're required to be maintained in the first place. And that also must be with the intent of causing harm to the association or to any member. The last criminal penalty is a third degree felony and that's if any person willfully or knowingly refuses to release or otherwise produce association records with the intent to avoid or escape detection, arrest, trial, or punishment for the commission of a crime. So, for example, if there was theft, embezzlement of funds, so on and so forth, and say someone did not appropriately or did not actually cover the tracks well, it's in the official records, a unit owner would like to uh, inspect the official records and would obviously be seen that someone is embezzling funds. And that person decides to throw away or not provide access to those particular records that would be criminally penalized under these new amendments. Okay. So, of course, we are highlighting the importance of giving access to official records. Um, there are specific records, as I mentioned, financial records that are definitely important. Unit owners are um, especially invested because they're paying assessments for. Um, the association to be run, and it's essentially their financials that are being maintained with the money that they're paying. So with that being the case, if a unit owner or homeowner actually owes any money to the association, be it a fine, be it an assessment, whatever it is that was imposed, if the owner requests in writing a detailed accounting of the amounts that they actually owe the association, the HOA must provide that accounting within 15 business days after they receive that written notice, okay? This is especially important because if that 15-day notice is not actually given, certain types of fines could be waived, specifically any fines that are more than 30 days past due, and if a notice of hearing was not given for that particular fine. So it's very important to adhere to that 15 business day response period to give an accounting for any monies that are owing um, by the owner. 
Now, it's always an issue with owners constantly requesting information. So there is a limitation that at least the owner, after they give that written request, they may not send another written request for at least 90 calendar days after the first request, okay? Um, some other financial limitations or extra requirements that were added, if an HOA has a thousand homes or more, they must prepare an audited financial statement regardless of the total annual revenues that they actually take in. Now, currently the statute, they specify based on annual revenue, which type of financial statement that the HOA actually has to prepare. Um, now this specifically says it doesn't matter what your revenues are. If you have a thousand or more parcels, you must prepare an audited financial statement. So definitely pertinent for our managers who handle accounting. Um, also relevant, an HOA may no longer substitute any required financial statement for another type of financial statement for consecutive fi fiscal years. So for example, um, if an HOA is required to provide a report of cash receipts and expenditures, um, rather if they're required to provide a compiled, reviewed, or audited financial statement, but they vote to instead only provide a report of cash receipts and expenditures, say that's what they do for year 2024, they cannot do the same thing for the fiscal year 2025. Whichever financial statement they're required to do for 2025, they have to do it and they can't waive it again until 2026, okay? So as I mentioned, there are some minor amendments that was regarding debit credit card use, specifically those that are issued in the name of the HOA itself or if it's billed directly to the HOA. Generally, there is a prohibition to actually um, using a credit card that's in the name of the HOA or billed to the HOA for any association expenses. However, it's only deemed to be theft if such credit card or debit card is used for any expense that's not a lawful obligation of the HOA. In other words, if the board did not approve the actual expense, then it's considered theft. Okay, so that's really, um, it, it. on its face, it doesn't seem to make sense, but the important thing to remember is theft if it wasn't approved. Okay. Next slide, please. So now we will touch a bit on the board member certifications. It's very important to know all of these amendments. And of course, when we have board member certifications and continuing education requirements, it's to ensure that the members who are serving on the board are well educated. Um, to do that, the legislature decided to impose some additional requirements. Um, the first being that the board member who has been elected or newly appointed can no longer sign just a certification saying that they read the governing documents in order for that to be sufficient to basically say that they are well educated in the um, provisions of that govern the association. Now they actually have to take a course and then submit the certification of completion of the course within 90 days of being elected or appointed. The certification is valid for four years and it must be renewed every four years. If the HOA has fewer than 2,500 homes, it has to be at least four hours for that continuing legal education that is completed annually. And if it's 2,500 or more homes, it has to be at least eight hours of continuing education that a board member completes every year. Okay, so part of that continuing education, I'm sure they'll hear about this, um, are kickbacks. I think everyone already knew generally the term colloquially kickbacks, but the legislator decided to really ingrain it into the statute and also make it a third degree felony to accept any kickbacks. So just for those here to define it for you, a kickback is basically to solicit, offer to solicit, or accept a kickback, which is anything or service of value for which consideration or something that was given in exchange has not been provided. And if the board member actually um, is benefited by accepting that particular kickback. So just another unfortunate criminal penalty that has been imposed and to be aware of. Okay, next slide, please. So these are the high level um, other modifications that were made in House Bill 1203 affecting homeowners associations. Again, near and dear to homeowners associations is their ability to control the architectural modifications within the community to protect property values, so on and so forth. Um, the legislature decided to limit that authority. Uh, specifically, the HOA may no longer limit or place requirements on the interior of a structure if those particular modifications are not visible from either the front of the home, from an adjacent home, or from any adjacent common area, 
or which this is an interesting one, or if the change is not visible from any adjacent community golf course. So of course in South Florida, we have some communities that have actual golf courses, a common area. So the legislature wanted to make sure that that was put in there and um, everyone knew that that counted, okay? Um, another limitation that HOAs may not do is to require any approval of plans for AC units, installation of refrigeration units, heating units, or ventilation systems. Um, again, if those systems are not visible from the front, adjacent home, the golf course, uh, adjacent common area, and if that particular equipment was already substantially in compliance with some other equipment that was already approved by the association or any committee of the association. Um, these HOA also may not restrict the installation of any vegetable gardens or any clotheslines, again, if they're not visible, as pre uh, previously mentioned, okay? And if the HOA does actually deny any type of modification for any reason whatsoever, um, they have to actually include in the written notice with the denial the rule that they relied on for the denial and why the actual application um, does not comply with the rule that they're relied on. So of course, this gives the owner more information so they can turn around and submit a new application if they need to or if they choose to, okay? For fines, um, of course, if, um, if the actual application is denied and the owner decides, for example, to continue with the modification, the HOA has some recourse, and one of those, of course, being fines. Um, there have been some limitations to the fining procedures. Specifically, a fine hearing must be held within 90 days of the issuance of that 14-day notice of hearing. Okay? The hearing may now be held via telephone or video conference, such as Zoom, as we're on now. But you have to make sure that the electronic information, whether it's telephone or Zoom information, is actually on the notice itself. I've seen some um, notice of hearings where the Zoom information is not on there. And if that were the case, of course, July of this year, it would not be valid. The fine would not be valid, even if it was actually imposed at the hearing itself. So definitely pay attention to that. Okay. Um, the committee's, the finding committee's written decision must be sent to whoever the violator is, the owner, the tenant, the occupant, whomever, within seven days after the hearing actually occurs. And within that notice, it has to include the expiration date of any suspension that was imposed, as well as the due date of any fine, okay? Nevertheless, if a violation is found by the finding committee, but it was cured before the hearing actually occurs, a suspension or fine cannot be imposed. So that is definitely a major change. I know currently if the owner cured it, but the violation still occurred before the hearing, they could still impose any type of fine and maybe reduce the fine, but they, if they were not required to actually not impose it. Now that is not the case. If it's cured before the hearing, you cannot impose any type of fine or suspension, okay? If the finding committee finds that a violation occurred, that it was not cured and approves the fine, the fine payment deadline must be at least 30 days after the delivery of the finding committee's written decision to the owner. Now, a major change to this as well is that if any attorney's fees and costs were incurred by the association, they actually cannot be awarded against the owner or the violator um, until after that fine payment deadline. So that's a huge change at this point because a lot of go governing documents, what they expressly say is that if you violate the documents, we can charge you and put on your ledger any type of attorney's fees that the association incurs. Now that is no longer the case, so definitely pay attention to that as well, okay? Two particular um, fines that can no longer be imposed one is for leaving a garbage can on the curb. If it's left on the curb within 24 hours, either before or after collection, um, the actual collection date, and fine cannot be imposed if holiday decorations were not removed unless the HOA actually sends a written notice requiring the owner to uh, remove the decorations and the decorations remain and then a week thereafter. So I know decorations are a huge point down here. It's in a lot of the... Um, Declaration, so definitely pay attention to that as well. Okay. Now there are other um, penalties imposed for election fraud. It's very similar in terms of um, 
if you help someone commit election fraud, it's now a first degree misdemeanor. There are also other prohibited clauses um, that cannot be in governing documents anymore. For example, pickup trucks can no longer be prohibited. You can no longer prohibit an owner from actually parking their work vehicle in their driveway, regardless of any type of signage that is on the vehicle. So currently, some a lot of HOAs require any type of lettering or announcements of the actual branding of a company to be covered up, that no longer can be required. They have to be allowed to park their work vehicle, as long as the work vehicle is not over 26,000 pounds, which is what makes it a commercial vehicle, okay? And just quickly, um, just some other things that were added, interest accruing on assessments. Now, interest, as we know, can be calculated simple compound. The legislature now says it must be co calculated in a simple format, not in compound basis, okay? And lastly, something that's very important, as we know, as far as police vehicles, they were already um, allowed to park in HOAs, regardless of them having the name of the city, that there are police department vehicles, so on and so forth. That has now been expanded to include all first responder vehicles. Um, that basically includes all law, law enforcement officer vehicles, firefighter vehicles, emergency medical technicians and paramedics, and any volunteers that fall within those categories. All of those vehicles have to be allowed to park in the association as well, okay? And the final amendment here, just to mention it, and this should be a quick fix. It's not really a major, thankfully not a major um, tedious change, but all of the members now have to have either a physical or electronic copy of the most current rules and regulations of the HOA. So of course, if there's just a quick email blast that a property manager or the board can send to the members of the association with a link if it's already on the website or with a copy of the uh, current rules and regulations that has to be provided by October 1st of this year. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So with that, I will turn it over to John Stevens to continue with our condominium amendments. So thank you, Ebriana. Thank you all for attending. Um, you know, I'd like to take a moment here to thank Doug and the wonderful people over at ACAM for inviting us here today. I think it's so important that you, you guys have a management company like ACAM that invests their time and resources into educating the community. Um, it, it's very important that all of us understand what's going on, especially those of us that are so intimately involved in the condominium and HOA community here in Florida. I've been doing this a, a little over 26 years. Uh, I'm board certified by the Florida Bar and Condominium and Real Property Development. Um, I, before I get into some of the specifics, I, I want to kind of talk a, a little bit of big picture here. I think we saw from Ebriana's presentation that the legislature has been moving in the direction with HOAs um, to more heavily regulate them. And I think as you'll see from my presentation regarding the condominiums, um, we've seen over the last couple of years, the legislature taking, in, in my opinion, a very heavy hand uh, in terms of regulations regarding the condominiums. So I think we have uh, some good news and we have some bad news as it relates to the condominium legislation this year. Um, the, uh, I'll start with the bad news. Uh, the bad news is that they passed it um, and that it's very restrictive and not very friendly to board members. The good news is, is that could have been a lot worse. Um, they, they did take a lot of it out. Um, a lot of it did not pass. Um, but the main um, House bill that was passed uh, by the legislature was 154 pages long. Um, so it includes some very, very substantial changes, in my opinion. Um, also, you know, if you, like many of my clients that live in condominiums um, or operate condominiums, uh, a lot of them were really concerned about the milestone inspections and the safety inspections, the expenses that were going to come next year from these milestone inspections and these structural integrity reserve studies. You know, a lot of uh, associations held off funding um, the immense amount of money that's going to be required to do these milestone inspections, hold off on doing the, their integrity reserve studies, uh, hoping that the legislature was going to do something to fix that, to give us a little bit of a break, to try to ease some of the economic pressure. Unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that they did absolutely none of that. Um, there's absolutely no relief, in my opinion, in any of these statutory changes. And in fact, I think you're going to see that um, 
some of them are going to adversely affect the condominium market um, just because they they put so many more requirements on condominium board members. So I think that if you take anything from today, um, you should know that the legislature is going to probably continue with this trend over the next couple of years. We see every indication that they're just going to start more heavily regulating the uh, condominium and HOAs. Um, I believe that many of the items that did not pass in, in this year's bill will be reintroduced next year. The legislature, as, as Doug pointed out, is calling this condominium 3.0. Uh, they have already vowed to make a condominium 4.0 next year. So I think we're going to see lots of the items that were excluded um, put into, into next year. So with that, there, there are really two main statutory changes that were put before the legislature in the past, the first being HB 1029. And this is kind of a, a it's the smallest of the bills. It, it's, it has, uh, I think, uh, the potential for great effect. Um, but what they tried to do here was provide a program in which the state is going to um, have inspectors that are licensed by the state to perform uh, inspections related to hurricane mitigation. Um, they're going to be licensed by the state. You're going to have an opportunity to apply uh, to the state to have one of these inspectors come out to your community to do a safety hurricane mitigation inspection. Um, they're going to look at things like your roof, your doors, your windows to determine if any mitigation can be done uh, for the hurricane. Uh, in order to do this, you're going to need a vote of the majority of the board members or a majority vote of the unit owners. Either one can request the inspection. So if the, the inspector comes out, they inspect, they find certain things that can be done to mitigate potential hurricane damage. The association will have the ability to uh, apply for grant money. Um, that grant money uh, and grant application can be approved by either majority of the board of directors or a majority of the unit owners if it's dealing only with common area property. Um, however, you can also do mitigation as it relates to individual units. Um, if you do mitigation related to individual units, you unfortunately have to get the approval, a uh, unanimous approval of all of your unit owners in order to do that. Um, once you've applied, the state will then review your grant application and can give you a grant up to a total of $175,000 uh, per association. Um, they will give you $2 for every $1 the association um, pays. Uh, and then there's some limitations regarding uh, how much money they'll pay for things like roof and doors. So for a roof, they'll give you up to $11 a square foot. Um, not to exceed $1,000 per unit, and they'll only pay for a maximum of 50% of the total cost of the work. Um, and then for doors and windows, they'll give you up to $750 per replacement, not to exceed $1,500 per unit, and they'll pay a maximum of 50% of the project cost. The problem with this, so this sounds great. I um, think that a lot of associations will be able to use this. The problem with this is all those numbers sound fantastic until you look at the amount of condominiums that are in the state of Florida and the amount of condominiums that could potentially qualify for the grant. Once you look at those numbers and then you look at what they propose to fund, um, which hasn't even completely been decided at this point, um, you're probably not going to get a lot of bang for your, for your, your buck. This is kind of like the advertisement where the state's giving out ten thousand dollars to each resident, but you know only fifty people qualify or something like that. So it, it's yet to see how many people will actually benefit from this program. It it sounds great in principle, but we'll have to see how it uh, how it functions in reality. So that's uh, that's HB ten twenty nine. If we could just move to the next slide, we'll talk about HB ten twenty one. This is the primary condominium amendment. So as I said, um, just like you saw with every honest presentation, you're going to see things in here um, such as uh, increase in uh, education requirements, uh, increased criminal penalties. Um, I, I like to unfortunately think of this as that the legislature is basically criminalizing uh, serving on a board. So it it's, you know, I hope not to scare you all away, but there are a lot of things to be frightened about in this bill. If you're a board member 
or God forbid, even a manager, there are criminal penalties that could be inflicted against you. So let's let's talk about a few minor ones to start. Um, these aren't criminal penalties, but a few of the statutory changes. So the first one is that after termination of a management firm, they now have 20 days to provide you all of the records. Um, the big thing here is if they don't give it to you within the 20 days on the 21st day, they can be fined up to $1,000 per day. So that's a pretty big change. It's a substantial financial incentive to get the documents done. Um, there's some minor changes to the conflict of interest portion of the statute as it relates to managers. In essence, any contract where they're going to utilize a company that they own or are related to, it has to be one fully disclosed, which it already does. Uh, it has to reference the conflict on the statute. It has to reference, I mean, on the contract, it has to reference the conflict in the agenda that's being posted. It has to have a copy of the contract attached to that agenda. And you have to now solicit um, bids from other parties for any contract that's more than $2,500. So um, these are all some you know, minor changes. We'll see some more substantial changes later, but um, they're again, they're moving towards banning anything that's a conflict of interest, penalizing certain conduct. So this is one of the ones where we'll see, see that. Also, any contract that is a potential conflict of interest now needs to be approved by two thirds of the board members that are present at the meeting. So the, uh, the next, this is the only place where they really talked about milestone inspections. Um, and it sounds initially like they're trying to help you. Um, basically they changed to say milestone inspections are not applicable to single family, two family, three family or four family dwellings that are three or, or fewer stories. Um, so they're limiting the scope of the miles, milestone inspections. Uh, however, this also now clarifies that it applies to anything that's more than four family dwellings, even if it's less than three stories. So there was some concern and discussion regarding milestone inspections about its application because of the use of the three story rule. Um, so now we know that it's that um, will apply to everyone, uh, even if it's one or two stories, uh, if it's less than four family dwellings in that building. So. Again, that's a, a, a fairly small change, but it has a significant impact. So let's talk a little bit about some insurance requirements that the um, they've changed. So any of you that handle money, which is all of you that sit on a board of directors, you have access to funds, you can cut checks, and your management company has access to funds and access to checks, will now have to have insurance and or be bonded um, in order to protect the association from potential theft of those funds. If you're not, if you don't have insurance and you don't have a fidelity bond for the maximum amount of funds that you could hold. So let's say you live in an association that has a million dollars in the bank at any given time, um, you have to have a million dollars worth of coverage. Um, the DPBR can fine you, they can monitor it, they can issue penalties for your failure to obtain this insurance or these bonds. And it has to apply to every single person that has control over your funds or has the right to disperse the funds of the association. So in essence, it applies to every single board member that's a signer on the account for sure. Um, but I would probably apply it to all of your board members and also to your management company. So again, that's a pretty big insurance requirement that's been added. Also effective, uh, again, just like we talked about in the HOA section, there's been a lot of changes in the official records. So here as we talk, and, and I, I wanna point out to you, just like in the HOA, that what's been happening year after year after year is the legislature has been trying to make associations more transparent, make it easier for residents to, to speak to their association, make residents have an easier ability to get copies of all the documents for the company, which you are a corporation um, that operates the community in which they live. So a lot of these changes that we're seeing both in the HOA and condominium setting are, are really set at making transparency and the ability of your residents to have this information. So effective January 1 of 2026, 
every association that's 25 units or more, it used to be 150, will now have to post digital copies of all of their official records on their website or mobile application. So we actually had a question uh, earlier that I answered where, and it was a great question, do we now have to pay for copies? So the rule is you still, if someone actually wants physical copies for the association to print, that still can be charged to them. A reasonable cost, the cost is set forth in the statute in the administrative code can still be charged to the residents for copies. However, copies really are no longer going to be needed because unless you live in an association under 25 units, all of your documents must be posted on your website and it has, it has to be accessible to your residents. We saw this earlier in the HOA setting as well. So again, this should be behind a password protected login where only residents have the ability to obtain it, but all of your records, 25 units or more, are gonna to have to be on a website. This is a very expensive endeavor for these smaller associations. So this is one of the key changes that you're gonna to have to look at. Also, um, as you know, a lot of people now use electronic uh, notices. Um, you know, Everyone has an email address, everyone's sending out notices by email. So one of the big things now is you cannot distribute, an association cannot distribute a unit owner's email or fax number unless the owner's consented to those electronic notices or they've consented to the dissemination of their contact information to the other owners. So you now, and that was always the case, but now the association has an affirmative obligation to redact those email and fax numbers from all the documents that are provided to third parties. So what does this mean? It means if you give out documents or you have documents now posted on your website that have email information, you have an affirmative obligation to redact that email information from anyone that is not consented to the electronic notice or the general dissemination. So that could be a substantial um, endeavor for some associations. So you just have to keep that um, in mind. So they've also expanded what needs to be an official record. Though I don't think it's a real expansion, there's always been a catch-all in the statute that says, and any other documents, which the division has always kind of interpreted as everything. But now they've added some, some new express language into the statute to include all invoices, transaction receipts, deposit slips, uh, receipts, all building permits, uh, certificates of your board member education certificates, so they've added a whole host of new documents that are specifically set forth as uh, official records. But like I said, I, I think that that's really not anything new because of the catch-all that's always been there. One of the big things changes with official records is they have to be now organized and maintained in a manner that facilitates the inspection. So, you know, I'll give you a, a, a perfect example. I, you know, I would have associations that would tell me, John Doe has made a records inspection request. We don't want them to come here. We'd like them to come to your office. Next thing you know, I have a, a record, uh, you know, like Iron Mountain or one of these records company delivering 50 boxes of records to my office. They're not dated. They're not organized. They're just kind of thrown into files inside of a box. Um, that's no longer permitted. The, the documents have to be organized in a reasonable fashion where someone can, can efficiently inspect the records in a meaningful way. So I think that that's gonna have much more impact than a lot of people think. It's just like a throw-in sentence, but I really think that that is gonna have a, a financial impact and also is gonna open up a lot of associations, I think, to an argument and complaints to the division that they were not properly maintaining the record. So I think we'll see a whole host of defense attorneys show up saying, I made a records request. They didn't have everything. The records were kept in a, in a way that I couldn't meaningfully look at it without spending days. And therefore you should issue a fine or a violation against them um, or make them take an educational class because they, they didn't comply. So I think that that's very important. Um, other big thing is it used to be that if you had lost a record, the record didn't exist, it was destroyed, you were not under any legal obligation to provide that information because you didn't have it. You really didn't have to go search for it. The legislature has added that you now have to make a good faith 
attempt at locating or recreating those documents. So what does that mean if you had Bank of America 10 years ago and now you have uh, Banco Popular and you don't have the records from Bank of America, um, you may have to go ask Bank of, Bank of America for those records. You, you may have to affirmatively take some action to go locate those things. So I think that that's different. Um, also, I, I think that this is a, a really big one is that when someone makes a records request, you can't just provide them the documents. You now have to provide them a checklist of all the documents that you've given them and all of the documents that are missing. So literally you have to go and create a checklist of all of these documents and it has to be delivered to them, the checklist when they get these documents. And then you have to maintain this list in your records for seven years. So every time you give out this list, if it changes, you have to maintain this checklist for, for seven years. So again, getting with some of the stuff we talked about earlier with Ebriana, they've now instituted criminal penalties for the failure to comply with these records requests. Um, they've made it a second degree misdemeanor for a board member or property manager. So for the property managers that are on here, this applies to you too, um, to repeatedly fail to respond to a records request. Again, repeatedly the same as we did in the HOA setting means uh, two or more times within a 12 month period. So you can be charged if you just decide not to provide records, there could be criminal charges if it happens repeatedly. You know, a lot of us, I think, saw in um, Palm Beach, there's been that recent case over records that has cost, I think it's a, a little over a million dollars now between the two sides, about, it's about a half million dollars uh, from each attorney, one for the condominium and one for the homeowner fighting over records. I, the state doesn't want that to happen. Um, so they want to make sure that we're all providing these records and and they're probably going to start prosecuting for failure to comply. Um, next, it's a first degree misdemeanor to knowingly or intentionally deface, destroy or fail to create accounting records. So if you intentionally fail to create accounting records to try to hide something, um, you can be charged with a, a first degree misdemeanor. If you destroy financial records. Um, intentionally, you could be charged with a first degree misdemeanor. And last but not least, it's a, a third degree felony to willfully and knowingly refuse to release documents with the intent to avoid or escape detection, arrest, trial, punishment, or the commission of a crime. So the first two that we talked about are just, you just didn't want to give them the records and you decided I'm not going to give it to them and I'm doing it intentionally and repeatedly or I'm destroying the second one, I'm destroying financial records because I'm trying to hide something. But the third one is if you don't give it to them because you've committed a crime or you want to hide a potential crime, that's why it's an increased, uh, that's why it's an, a felony instead of a misdemeanor. So this is going to punish all of these people that have done this. Unfortunately, I'm sure, um, you know, thankfully it's not that many. I think in my 26 years, of practice, I've only seen about six board members arrested in various associations um, for things like this. I've had, um, you know, a couple a couple people arrested for thefts. Uh, one lady was hiding accounting records and and stealing uh, the washing machine money. Never thought that someone would steal the coins out of a washing machine, but she stole several hundred thousand dollars over a course of a decade out of the washing machine. So. You know, they're they're cracking down on all this. Um, financial reporting, again, they're they're requiring that you can't substitute the required financial reporting um, two years in a row. So if you have to do an audit um, and you have the right to waive that and vote on it, you can only do that one year. You can't do it two years consecutive consecutively. Um, same like an HOA with debit cards. Um, basically, I would tell all of you, if you have a debit card, go cut it up. Um, cancel it, don't use it. Um, it's, it's in essence illegal to use the debit card um, or to have one in the name of the association. Um, and if you use it for an expense, that's not a lawful obligation of the association. It's theft, which really was always theft if you use someone else's debit card for your own um, expenses, but it's now specifically theft in the statute. 
and you must be removed from office if if there's if if you're accused of that. So um, again, I would just cancel all of your debit cards. I wouldn't use them. I don't think it's a great idea. Um, board meetings. I think this is a big one. So a lot of my associations, especially my small ones, I have associations as small as four units and as large as 8,000 units. So the 8,000 unit associations, they always run pretty smooth because they're more like a government. When you get down to a four unit association or even a 20 unit association or God forbid, even a hundred unit association, they don't necessarily all function the same. So they have made it that um, you now, if you have 10 or more units, you have to be in at least once a quarter. So a lot of associations I know, especially on the smaller end, would only meet once a year at their annual meeting. They would then go and make every other decision by email or phone call, which they're not allowed to do. So just, it's not in the statute, but just so everyone here, because I have 73 people who have no place to go, but to listen to me, so I can stand on my soapbox for a minute. I, I, I would like to point out that every decision you make as a board has to be done at a duly called meeting at which a quorum has been obtained and that you properly noticed your membership. You cannot have phone calls. You cannot have executive meetings to make decisions. You can't go and meet in your garage or on your lanai to make decisions without notifying the residents. You can't call up your friend, make the decisions at Bridge or any of these other things that I've heard over these 26 years. You have to do it at a board meeting. It has to be in your minutes. So because a lot of associations don't do that, and a lot of associations will meet once or twice a year, usually for their annual meeting in their budget, and then they just don't function the rest of the time. The legislature is now mandating that we meet at least once a quarter. Also, at least four times a year, so once a quarter, your agenda now has to include the opportunity for your membership to ask questions of the board. So you can't just have a meeting and put an agenda and say, you can't talk to us because the item's not on the agenda. You actually have to give them an opportunity, and we're going to have to put on your agenda as an agenda item, the opportunity for your residents to ask you questions, okay? And they have the specific right to ask you questions regarding the status of construction, the status of any repair um, projects, the status of any revenue or expenditures during that fiscal year, and any other issue that potentially affects your condominium. So you have to do this now. You have to get out and speak to your residents. So... I will tell you, I actually think that we're going to have a lot of complaints from some of our boards because this takes up a lot of your time. I would tell you that this is an actually a good thing for most boards because the more you meet with your residents, the more you allow them to participate. I think the easier it is for you, the easier it is for your manager, the easier it is for me as your attorney. So I actually think this it's time consuming, but I actually think it's a great thing. Um, also, on your meeting notices. So as you all know, you have to have an agenda that's posted with your meeting. That was added recently to the HOA last year. So, you know, point that out to those of you from the HOAs that are still here that you have to have an agenda also. And you have to now include for a condominium, if you're considering any contracts, you have to include a copy of that contract on the agenda. So you gotta make sure that that's there. Um, if you're doing a special assessment, uh, you have to state on the agenda that a special assessment will be considered. You have to provide estimated costs and description of the purpose of the assessment. So all of those have to go on your notices from now on. Here's a, another big change, getting with some of the things that Evriana talked earlier. I think we're going to see this expand probably even more as we move forward. Um, you used to be able to sign a certificate that said that you've read the condominium documents, that you understand them, that you're familiar with the law. And if you did that, you didn't have to attend one of these board member certification classes um, that we all have and, and, and teach. Um, that's no longer the case. Now, every single one of you are going to have to attend a certification class. Um, and they've also, uh, extended the time for that substantially. So it's now has to be four hours long, the class. So you're going to have to sit for a four hour class. So plan on spending a, a fairly substantial amount of time to do this class. 
It has to cover now the milestone inspections, the structural integrity reserve studies, elections, record keeping, financial literacy, transparency, the levying of fines, and the notice requirements for meetings. So all of that now must be within your class. Um, if you were elected before July 2024, um, you now have to do this class and have the certificate by June of 2025. So even if you're elected, uh, you know, again, you have the old certificate, it doesn't count. By June 30, 2025, anyone elected before July 1, 2024 is going to have to sit and take this class and submit their certification. The certification is going to be valid for seven years. Um, but you now, even though they're good for seven years, every single year that you're a board member, you have to take at least one hour of continuing education. So you're going to have to plan one hour every year to sit and talk about the changes to the Florida statutes and the administrative code, which is in essence what this class is today. So every year you'll come back and you'll listen to um, someone talk to you about the changes that our legislature has made in their infinite wisdom um, and is imposing upon you. So again, four hours for the initial certification, one hour every year for the continuing education. So again, sticking with the concepts of punishment and crimes, they've also listed a whole host of offenses that now require the removal of a board member. So now board members must be removed for any indictments for forgery of ballots or forgery of voting certificates, theft or embezzlement of funds, destruction or refusal to allow inspection of official uh, records and furtherance of a crime, obstruction of justice, or any other criminal violation that's found within chapter 718. So again, they've set all of these criminal codes in here. If you violate any of the criminal codes, you may be indicted. If you're indicted, you're off the board. Okay. So, I mean, that's in essence, very plain, simple English, you know, what's going on here. Um, any vacancy has to be filled pursuant to the bylaws. If the bylaws don't specify how to replace the vacancy, it has to be done by an election. And most importantly here, an indicted board member cannot have access to the official records absent a court order. This is because they don't want them to start fixing their story, doctoring the records. So they're barred from access to the records while the indictment is pending. Okay. Again, we'll go with some criminal penalties, just like we talked about in the HOA setting. Um, they've set forth a whole host of criminal penalties related to elections. So it's now a first degree misdemeanor if you willfully or falsely swear or affirm um, or swear to affirm an oath um, arising out of a voting activity. If you perpetrate or attempt to perpetrate or aid in the perpetration of fraud in connection with voting or casting of a ballot, if you prevent a member from voting or preventing a member from voting as he or she intended by fraudulently changing or attempting to change a ballot, ballot envelope or voting certificate, that's a, a first degree misdemeanor. Um, I, I find this interesting. What if I get into an accident with a member on the way there? I wonder if I could be charged with a, an election offense. But you never know. We're going to see what this what this does. Menacing, threatening, or using bribery or any other corrupt attempt to directly or indirectly influence or deceive or deter a member from voting um, is now also a first degree misdemeanor. So we have these whole host of, of criminal penalties that have come in for interfering with elections. It's a whole host of criminal penalties for interfering with records inspections. So let's talk a little bit about hurricane protection. So again, this is a, I think, a, a substantial monetary change. So the rule for Florida condominiums has always been that if a condominium has to remove an item that's attached to the common elements for purposes of fixing the building. So these would be things like you're removing items for paint or for waterproofing or to repair the stucco or to repair the concrete. The, uh, the rule has always been that the unit owner has to pay to remove that item and to replace it if they wanted to replace it. So the legislature has now changed that as it applies to hurricane protection. 
So as it applies to hurricane protection, we're talking here about hurricane windows, hurricane doors, uh, hurricane shutters. Um, if the board um, is going to remove those items, it's now the association's responsibility to, in essence, pay for that removal and that replacement. Okay. Also, um, with sticking with the theme of hurricanes here, uh, it now allows the board members to, by a majority vote, to require unit owners to install hurricane protection that complies with or exceeds the building code. So the board, if you live in a high rise, the board can um, take a vote uh, by the majority vote of the members, majority vote of the board, and require that the unit owners install the hurricane protection. If they do that, it now has to include a, a certificate in essence, we've never done this before, but I would envision this would be just like a certificate of amendment, just like you see with your amendments to the documents. Um, it would include a certificate showing that the members approved the installation of the hurricane protection and the deadline for the installation of the hurricane protection. And this certificate would then have to be recorded in the county. So if you're here in Broward or if you're in Dade or if you're in Palm Beach, we would record that certificate in the county in which the building is located. And then a copy of that certificate has to be delivered to all of the members, okay? You do not need a membership vote to install hurricane protection if the installation maintenance repair of the exterior windows doors um, is the association's responsibility. So if you live in an association, your windows and doors can either be your individual unit owner's responsibility or it could be the responsibility of the association. If it's the responsibility of the association and the, and the association already has to maintain these openings, then the association under this new statute has the right to go in and replace the windows, the doors, add hurricane protection um, without the approval of the members, okay? So I think that that's also, uh, that's a pretty substantial thing that the association can now do. Um, they cannot require um, installation if the current window and door or hurricane protection that's already there meets the applicable building code. So if I'm gonna go and I'm gonna change out all the windows and doors in my community and John Stevens unit already has compliant um, hurricane protection, they can't require me to change that out. So until it's reached the end of its useful life, okay? Um, let's see here. Um, oh, one of our favorite things, I get questions about this, no one really understands it. Uh, strategic lawsuits against public participation, what we call slap suits. So in essence, these are lawsuits that the association will typically bring against what they deem a problem child. So Ebriana lives in my neighborhood and she showed up to a meeting and told um, me that she thought I wasn't doing a good job as a board member. So I go and I try to punish Ebriana by suing her for defamation or slander or I fine her or I don't give her um, you know, the same services I do to anyone else or I threaten her in any way. That is a slap suit, um, potential slap suit and retaliation. And so I'm barred from doing that. So again, a condo association cannot find someone, discriminate, uh, discriminatorily increase someone's uh, assessments, decrease their services or bring or threaten an action for possession or defamation or liable or slander or tortious interference in order to try to stop someone from being able to exercise their rights to free speech. So, um, so long as the owner acted in good faith and not for uh, improper or, or frivolous purpose, um, that those types of actions are not gonna be allowed, okay? Um, also prohibited, prohibits the association from expending any funds related to any of those types of lawsuits. So you could get in trouble if you expend any type of money for defamation, liable slander uh, against a unit owner for speaking out. I can't tell you how many times one of my board members will call me to say, you know, we have the annual meeting next week and they just passed out a, uh, a letter saying how terrible I am. I want to go sue them for, uh, you know, for slander. 
So we'll go hire an attorney, go do whatever you're going to do. Oh, no, the association needs to do it. Sorry, the association cannot do it. That's a slap suit and it's not um, permitted. Okay. Uh, also, if we're going to suspend anyone's voting rights, uh, we now have to notify them at least 90 days before the election uh, that their rights may be suspended for non-payment. If you don't do it at least 90 days prior to the election, um, you cannot uh, suspend their voting rights. Uh, the statute also greatly expanded the division's ability to investigate. So the division and or the ombudsman can now attend any of your meetings that are open to members. So they, they can't attend a private meeting with your attorney. They can't attend a closed meeting for personnel matters, but they can attend any meeting that's been open to your residence, which is every other type of meeting. Um, they can also request at any time uh, access to your website so they can check regarding access to the public records. Um, big thing here, we talked earlier about all of the criminal penalties. So the division now has a legal obligation to report to the local law enforcement any person that they believe has engaged in fraud, theft, embezzlement, or criminal activity. So if someone complains to the division about you and the division investigates and the division determines that they believe that there's some sort of criminal conduct, they now have to report that to the local law enforcement agency. So that's something new that didn't typically happen uh, previously. Um, so that we'll see how that works and if there's um, substantially more prosecutions in this area. Um, also, they have the right to um, investigate all financial in uh, issues, annual reports, common expenses, fines, commingling of funds, uh, the use of debit cards, budgets, reserves, any of your financial records, anything dealing with elections, um, recall of board members, electronic voting, um, you know, anything dealing with uh, quorums, meetings, proxies notices, conflicts of interest, um, kickbacks. It's a whole list of items that the division can now have investigators to investigate. I think we're going to see, uh, uh, as the years go on, like I talked, a substantial increase in the power of the division. They're going to become more of a policing agency. Um, I think we're going to see that they're going to have to substantially increase their budget. Um, I will tell you that everything with the division takes forever right now. I think I have something like 15 classes pending approval now for like a month. So usually they used to take a week or two. Um, everything is very slow at the division. I think they're going to have to add a substantial amount of funding, a substantial amount of, of workforce. And I think we're just going to see more and more increases in their policing powers as we move forward. So um, with that, um, that's the end of the condominium section. Why don't we let Ebriana talk a little bit about some of the bills that died. So. Um, just before I let her speak, these are bills that did not pass this year. Um, they either failed or more likely almost all of them. Um, they just weren't, the, the legislature just didn't finish getting to them. So they were in committee when the legislature closed. So for those of you who don't know, the legislative session is a set period of time. When they run out of time, those bills just die if they haven't been passed. And then they would have to be reintroduced in the following year. So these are bills that died in committee or were voted down. Um, I will would expect some of these to move forward, especially the first one that um, that everyone is going to talk about, which is the estoppel certificates. There's been a really big push over the last couple of years to limit the amount that can be charged for estoppels. And also this year, they actually tried to basically make it so that associations could not charge for estoppels. So um, with that, Ebriana, if you please talk about the three bills that, that died for us. You're muted. So we did, I can see that, thank you. I did, uh, that's Zoom, a little technical snap in there, but yes. So we did outline um, these three bills, as you can see high level, what the, um, what if they were passed, what they would have covered. And I do agree these top certificates was definitely a big one. Uh, managers tend to charge for preparation of estoppels. I think a big note there, if we do see it come back, if there's an issue with the estoppel certificate, um, the HOA or condominium can no longer indemnify. Um, so 
say if there's a lawsuit because an stop certificate was provided, there's incorrect information, the homeowner relied on it, and then sues whomever prepared the estoppel certificate, the association could no longer provide a defense for whoever provided the um, estoppel certificate. It now is up to the manager to provide their own defense. So, of course, that gives an incentive to ensure all the information is correct before it's actually sent to the owner. So I agree 100 percent. The stop certificate portion is definitely important. It also shortened the time to provide the stop certificate and it removed that extra fee for providing an expedited uh, stop certificate. So if it was three days or less, you can't charge. I think it was an extra 200 some odd dollars that was going to be removed. Thankfully, it's not removed yet. So of course, look at the current statute for all of those um, fees that you can charge. It also uh, created penalties if you actually charged any fee that was not expressly provided for in the statute. So as was, as was, was mentioned, these are important because even though they died now, they're most likely to come back. I kind of had this picture in my head of zombies, right? They die, but when you don't want them to, that's when they come back and they give us, you know, all of this may mayhem and chaos. So definitely keep an eye out for these for next year to see if they are back on track to be approved by the legislation. Okay. Okay, guys, thank you. John, uh, just to add on is one of the things you mentioned was the, the, the increased powers of the DVPR. And one of the things, too, that was included in this statute is that they now have the right to access a, an association's website as well as attend association meetings. Correct. Yes, sir. I think that that, you know, we're and we're going to see a lot more of that. So I think where, where we're going to see this is that um, a resident's going to make a records request, right? And the records request is not going to be answered in a timely manner or it's going to be answered and they're going to say, come to my office to see these records. And the resident's going to file a complaint with the division saying, um, you know, I have to go there to see them. It's not on the website. I've looked on the website. And so the division, I've actually had this happen previously where the division will actually send a letter to the association and say, we want a login and passcode for your website so that we can go through and make sure that every single document that is required under the statute to be on your website is there. So because the, 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 the new statute has greatly expanded what needs to be put on your website, basically everything has to be on your website now, right? We're required to post all official records on your website. Um, they're going to want to log in to make sure that th this is readily available. And, and like I said earlier, we had a, a great question, initial question from one of the residents that I answered where he asked whose responsibility it is to pay for copies. So the statute still requires the unit owner to pay the cost of copies um, if they come and they actually make a physical copy. But now there's really no longer a need for these copies because I, I need to be able to, if it's 25 units or more, I need to have a website where I can log in and there's a portal that's gonna be there that's gonna have every single document and it's gonna to have to be organized. I'd suggest probably even searchable um, it's probably going to be have to be scanned in, in, a, in a searchable manner, organized, you know, in files or properly named so that we can identify it. Um, it's not going to just be able to see. I looked at a website for one of my associations the other day and, you know, I pulled open their official records and it was like PDF 1001.2.3 section eight. And I'm like, well, what does that even mean? That's not a meaningful search. So, you know, these associations are going to have to have um, IT support to go in and properly uh, institute a, a file system, a naming system, um, probably even a search system so that these are easily accessible and searchable in a meaningful manner. Um, everything's going to be there. Everything should be able to be printed. Um, a lot of associations now are even going to mobile apps where you can get these things on your phone. So, um, you know, it, we're in a, it's a whole new world in terms of records inspection. So I think those are some... I think you pointed out correctly. So there's the onus is now much more on boards and management companies to comply with all of these new statutes or all of these new bill provisions. As you would expect, we do have a number of questions that I'd like to get to. Uh, just to make a note to everybody, we've you know presented uh, an incredible amount of information today. So if you had registered, obviously you had, if you're attending, you will be emailed a link shortly 
uh, that will have this uh, webinar recorded so that you will be able to get the link and take a look at it more leisurely and maybe ask some questions of your counsel or your accounting professionals about it. So without further ado, let me start going into the Q&A that, uh, that we've received. And the first question, is there a conflict of interest form that we can ask each board member to sign? So there's there's no uh, form that the legislature has adopted. Um, I would suggest that you speak with your attorney or maybe even your manager might have one that they've utilized in another association. Um, you know, we, we do have one that we've created for our board members to sign. Um, like I said, I represent one association that's almost 8,000 units. Um, we make them sign it and all of their committee members sign it to acknowledge that that they either don't have a conflict of interest or if they do have a conflict of interest that they won't vote on any item before that company that they have the conflict of interest and we require them to note those those potential conflicts so there is no form um it would have to be either created by your attorney or, or you'd have to find one but they're they're readily available uh, one of the big things that you touched on, and, and I think it's going to be sinking into the associations, is that change with the milestone in terms of which buildings are now fall under having to have that milestone performed in that the original uh, bills had said anything less than three stories, but now with this new bill has clarified that to mean anything less than four families. So theoretically, if you have a two-story building with 27 units in it, that would theoretically now have to be part of that milestone. So the question that we have on this is, can a local AHJ or can a local municipality supersede or do anything to change that for their local municipality? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. And it really, this applies to almost all laws and statutes. So the municipality has the right to pass a more restrictive ordinance. So they could pass an ordinance that basically said, everybody has to have a milestone inspection, right? They could say, we don't care that the legislature said one, two and three or four family homes are exempt. Everybody has to do it, um, but they could not ease the restriction. So. They could not make it easier and say, OK, it doesn't apply unless you're five stories or six stories. Um, but with all statutes, they, they, they. Unless they've been expressly prohibited from doing it by the legislature, which there are some statutes that are they've been expressly prohibited from doing, um, they can make a more uh, stringent requirement, but not an easier. requirement. And I think, again, this question also begs just an, an, just again to reiterate that, and as you so succinctly put it, that a lot of associations were saying, oh, you know, the legislature is going to afford us some relief on the milestone and the Sears, they have not. So I just want to caution every association to get these things done because the clock is ticking on them. I mean, this year is the deadlines. So yeah, it's so make sure that you're getting those in. Now, there are certain areas that are allowed in terms of the municipality can give you an extension if you're contracted to do them, but the professional can't get them done in time. But that's really a local AHJ issue. But you have to operate on the fact that there was no extension, there was no relief. So those who were hesitating, you have to get off the, the chair and start doing this. Yeah, so I, I think, that Doug, that's, a, that's an amazing point. I, I think you're right on. Um, a lot of boards have been trying to wait to see if there was going to be any type of relief. I, I don't see any relief coming, and, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I don't necessarily think that there's any potential for relief until there's some catastrophic event occurs. So until nobody can afford to pay for it, we're not going to see any relief. Um, all the push has been to increase the restriction, require more inspections, um, also, I, I think that, you know, I, I've spoken with the mayor of Broward and, and I know Dade County has a, a small program where they instituted grant money to try to help um, some condominiums with some of the funding for these milestone inspections. It's a very minor amount of money. It, it Very few associations can qualify for it. 
when I spoke with the, the mayor um, here, basically um, the answer was, we don't have the ability to fix the problems that are created by the legislature. Um, we don't have the funds to do it. Um, even if we tried to pass a law similar, an ordinance similar to that in Dade County, it would apply to a, just a few condominiums and really wouldn't have any meaningful effect and would cost us a lot of money. I also think that the biggest thing to look here is, is it's always better to act now, right? Um, it's easier to get small amounts of money than to get large amounts of money. So if we wait and we wait and we wait, um, we're never going to be able to come up with the funds to do these things. So it's much better to, to have rolled this out. The, the associations that started prepping for this last year are going to be in a much better position than the ones that are waiting until this year. Um, so, you know, I think Doug's key here is let's not bury our head in the sand. Now's the time for action. Let's get ahead of the curve. Let's make sure that we're prepared for this coming because there's, there's nothing that is going to hurt you worse as a board member than having to quadruple your, um, your monthly maintenance next year or having reserves that are thousands of dollars that nobody can afford. So better and to I do it I also think it, it tags on to the fact that you're going to be those, those properties facing insurance renewals. You're going to start seeing, and, and it's already happened, that the carriers that you're going to go out to, even though they're still limited, are going to want to see these milestone inspections. They're going to want to see what the condition of the building is. So if you're not able to produce one, that could impact on the amount of choices that you have for your insurance renewal coming up uh, in, in the next year. So getting back to the questions, um, one of them was whose expense is the insurance and bond that is required by the board member with access for money? Yeah, so so that's a that's another great question. The expense is going to be a common expense of the association. So this would be divided up amongst the members, just like any other maintenance obligation. Um, so the board members don't have to pay this. Don't worry about that. This has to be paid um, from the association, and it's going to be divided up just like any other maintenance obligation. But I, before we go on, Doug, I, I just want to talk one more thing about the the milestone inspection because I I think you you made a great point. Not only are we going to have trouble getting insurance um, because they're going to want to see these milestone inspections. I just had an association in Palm Beach that did their milestone inspection. And their milestone inspection showed uh, some structural problems on their walkways. They're, you know, like a garden style apartment on the ocean. And basically they needed to do some fix to some uh, concrete spalling and some waterproofing. And um, the mortgage companies have started denying granting mortgages because of what they view as a structural problem in the milestone inspection. So I think we're gonna start seeing some mortgage problems, some insurance problems. Um, so again, I, that was a great point, Doug. Yeah, I think it's really gonna, it's really gonna impact everybody in this market. It's really something that, you know, boards need to really get on top of. Uh, continuing on, uh, we had another question. Um, what, who or what entity will notify condo boards of the new requirements and who will enforce them? Yeah, so I, I think that this is a, you know, unfortunately, there is going to be a lot of, not every management company is as proactive as ACAM is. So not every manager is going to be out there telling their residents about these changes. So a lot of people aren't going to know, honestly, until they violate the statute. Um, you know, we, we take it from our law firm. We mail out notice to our residents. We discuss it at, at board meetings. We send our managers notification of the updates. Um, you know, a lot of us are taking classes on these things. Um, you know, th this is fairly new, but um, I think this is Doug's second class that, that he's uh, participated in revolving this. And this has only been out for a week or two. So. You know, we all that are in the industry try to be very familiar with it. We try to uh, educate you, which is why um, ACAM has put on this wonderful presentation for you today to try to get out in front of everybody so that you are all educated on it. But unfortunately, a lot of people are just not going to be educated until they run into a problem. Um, One of the things, too, as John men just mentioned, and this again goes back to contacting your own association council. And I've seen John's uh, 
firms updates and pretty much any council that's doing condominium and HOA law is going to be doing an update on this. So you should have, you should contact your council for their firm's update on this. So that, you know, again, going back to your council is paramount here to understand the nuances of these bills as it pertains to your specific association. Um, we have here, does the board still have to reinstall hurricane protection if the protection no longer meets current code? So there is no requirement for you to install hurricane protection. The, the statute set up to give you a means to install hurricane protection throughout your, your condominium if the board and the residents so choose. So if you don't want hurricane protection um, and the board doesn't want hurricane protection and the residents don't want hurricane protection, you're, you don't have to do it um, unless the, your local, your local uh, municipality requires it for some reason. But this gives us the ability to do it and sets up how we're going to pay for it if it's authorized. And, and just to further on that question, most municipalities will tell you that if you are, let's say you're removing shutters um, you know, to do a concrete restoration or a stucco restoration project, and they don't have a valid NOA that you have, you can't reinstall them. That you would have to reinstall current code required ones. So that is something that you should check with your AHJ or your local building department for a definitive answer to that. Next question is: Can a candidate go door to door to tell homeowners who to vote for and also tell them who not to vote for, and wait for them to vote and sign outer envelope and collect them? Yeah, so so there's no prohibition against that. Um, the prohibition would come in as if they forge your vote or forge your signature, or you threaten them by telling you know someone threatens them and say, "Look, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take care of your family if you don't sign here," or you know you're gonna find your car missing. You know, if there's some sort of threat, then that's a crime. Um, but certainly they can campaign. There's been a numerous amount of arbitration decisions revolving campaigning. And pretty much, it, it's pretty much been universally permitted. Okay. Uh, the question is, where can I get a copy of the legislative updates that affect condominium board members? As we said, uh, if you, you should go talk to your association council, they're going to have probably a summary of the new bills. Also, if you really want to do a deep dive and you want to get the actual copies of the bills and read them, they are available on the Florida Senate website. You can even just search in just in Google search, you know, HB 1021 Florida legislature and their site will come up and you'll be able to download the actual bill, which it's pretty boring reading, but it does give you all the nuances of it. So that is available on the Florida Senate website. There's also something that's interesting on that website. It's called the bill analysis. And that is something that's put on during the legislative session where the, there's an analysis of the bill as it stands at that point, not necessarily what the finished bill will be or the one that's enrolled. And, and John, I just wanna make a point on that is that at this point in time, I think as you said, as, as, as late as last night, these have not been signed into law. Correct, yes, sir. So all of these are, are what's considered enrolled, meaning that they've passed both houses, the same version has passed both houses of our legislature, um, and they're awaiting um, transmission to the governor. Um, once they're transmitted to the governor, the governor can either sign them, veto them, or ignore them. If the governor ignores them, then they'll automatically go into law on the date of their effective date. All of these, the effective date, that was a question I saw in here, are July one. 2024. Um, however, there are some provisions in both statutes um, where just that provision applies at an earlier or later date. But overall, it's July 1st, 2024. We have a question on condo property. Are trucks and lettered commercial vehicles now allowed on property, even if condo docked for a living? So, so, so far, the answer is no, that section was uh, applicable only to HOAs. Um, I would expect that that will probably change over time. Um, you know, it, it, basically what we see 
it's the the legislature does one in one statute and they eventually change it to match in the other statute um pretty it's pretty similar right the the two the two statutes are becoming more and more alike as the years go on another question is may a board member who is also a candidate handle outside envelopes prior to counting so there there's um the answer would be no i would not um i do not believe that a candidate should have any um relationship to either handling or counting the envelopes um a board th there's no, nothing in the statute that involves this um but they really should be um, completely independent people. Um, typically when I'm running an annual meeting, I ask for volunteers, unless the management company is providing um, representatives to come and, and handle it. I typically ask for volunteers, I have them appointed. Um, and then we actually ask if, if anyone has a conflict or if any of the residents object to these per people handling and counting the ballots. And then also just to point out, all ballots have to be dealt with in open and public where the candidates and the residents have the right to review the counting. I've been to a couple of associations where they tried to lock themselves in a, into a private room, um, not permitted at all. Um, they have to, you have to be able to sit there and watch them so long as you're not interfering. Um, personally, I don't even handle the ballots. I, I only really like um, the residents who have been appointed by the members to come up and count them. That's that, but that's more of my preference. And I think one of the things that is going to be come out of these regulations, just in general, again, you know, putting onus on associations and board members and everything that you're going to see. And we recommend it to our clients that they make sure that either they have association council at the annual meeting to oversee this, and or there's also there's also a, an ombudsman that can be you know, gotten from the state directly so that they can oversee the election. And I think with these more onerous regulations, I think more associations are going to be looking to have these elections monitored more than uh, not. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we had now we have another question here on an association's website. If the association website is public and anyone can access it, am I still required to post all the official records? So you're required to have a website that's not public. So you're going to have to, when you create the website, the website is gonna to have to be, uh, have a login and passcode in order to obtain those records. So the, the records are gonna to have to be behind a locked provision accessible only to the residents. Uh, here's something uh, going off in the reserves again, any requirement to force 100% reserve on condos with only villas, and this is particular to Palm Beach County, and the maximum four units per building. Yeah, so so this is a a, a very this is a, a great question. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have a definitive answer on this. I will tell you my opinion on it. Um, I actually asked the division this question at uh, our October meeting. I uh, I meet with the not just me, but all the board certified attorneys meet with the division in October of each year at our big symposium. So I asked this question and the division's interpretation is that while the structural integrity reserve in, um, inspection and, and, and survey is limited by height of building, they do not believe that the enforcement of reserves because it doesn't have the the height limitation, they don't believe that it is applicable to whether or not you have to reserve. So their position is, is that you still have to 100% reserve for all structural items if you're a condominium, regardless of your size. That was their interpretation. And there was also a question, there was also something that happened, I believe, in one of, one of the bid analysis of uh, of uh, 1021 was that there was something that they said, oh, they were going to restrict and not allow pool reserves for Sears components. But I think that was was an incorrect. And I think a lot of people picked up on that and were kind of freaked out by it. From what, what my understanding is, that is not anywhere in the bill. It, it's not in the bill as far as I've located. I've read this thing so much I no longer have hair. But... <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, it, it's it's not in the bill as far as as far as we can see. But here, the 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 interesting thing with this question is that you have two sections of the statute that were written incredibly poorly, if you ask me. Um, the the section that requires the structural integrity reserve studies says that you only have to do it if you're three stories or higher, right? Um, but then th there's another section of the statute that says that you can no longer waive reserves as it applies to any of the lists in the statute under the stru structural integrity reserve study. So um, most people's interpretation, I mean, some people try to insinuate that, you know, the three story somehow comes over. But I think the safer answer is, is that based on the way it has been written is that you cannot waive reserves on any of the items that are listed in the section on on Sears, on the Structural Integrity Reserve Study, right. regardless again, of your... Right, again, a perfect reason why you should consult your reserve specialist or your counsel or your, your financial people on that for your particular association. We have one last question that is, um, I am a condominium board member that was reelected in January of 2024. Then I completed the three hour CE course for condominium board members on 2 2024. Do I have to take an additional one hour course to complete four hours by 2025, as mentioned in our webinar today? Yeah, so I, my interpretation, you're probably not going to like my interpretation. Um, my interpretation of the statute is, is that not only do you have to take um, the course by 2025, you can't just take an additional one hour. Um, the, the course is completely changed. So the four hour course now has specific requirements in it that have to be included that were not included in the prior condominium board member certification course. So I believe, and, and there's there's been no approvals for this four hour course yet. Right. So we don't have the educational guidelines from the division that interpret the statute. We so we don't know exactly what the course is going to look like. No one's had approvals for it. But what I believe is that you're going to have to take a completely new four hour course that complies with the statutory requirements by 2025. That's why they gave you basically an extra year to do it. Okay, great. Well, I, I got to say, I mean, th this has been one of the most informative webinars that I've been pleasure to be participate in. And Mr. Stevens, Ms. Wiggins, I can't thank you enough. And just if I may ask you guys to just to give a final statement to our, our, our listeners and our, our webinar participants on, again, how important these new laws are and how important it is for compliance. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I can speak for both Ebriana and I. So first of all, I want to thank you all for taking out, a, you know, a substantial amount of your afternoon to sit and talk with us. This, this, I, I think these types of events need to happen more and more. Um, it's so important to the condominium and HOA community that we have these type of educational events. I think the more education we have, the less violations we'll see, the less violations we see, the, the less the legislature is going to be tempted to make it more onerous on all of us. I think that we're here today because we had a couple bad actors um, in the state that made a lot of headlines regarding the operation of their HOA down in Miami. We've had a lot of reports coming out of Miami of things, condominiums uh, engaging in wrongdoing. So I think the, the more education we have, the better compliance we have, the better compliance we have, the less the legislature is going to inflict upon all of us. So I, I think that, you know, it is so amazing that you have ACAM and Mr. Weinstein um, given us the ability to speak with you, given this forum, uh, having this come together with all of you guys. So, you know, thank you so much, Doug. We really appreciate being here. Um, I really appreciate all of our participants. I know we've we've lost about 24 of, of you uh, yeah. as time has gone on, but the 50 of you who've hung out, um, you know, I really appreciate you staying with me until almost 540 at night. So. Thank you all yes, very much. Thank, thank you both. It was incredibly informative, a lot of information to really absorb. And as I mentioned before, if you have, obviously, those of us that were on the webinar, you are registered, so you will receive uh, a link towards the video version of this so you can refer to it 
and also talk to maybe a disseminated to your fellow board members as well. So those that were not able to attend were are able to get more educated. And as John just said, the whole thing here is education and how and compliance. So with that, thank you both again. I appreciate your sticking with us. Thank you to all our participants for this most important webinar. And to all, have a good evening and a safe home. Thank you again.